How do we come to this bipedal posture that is good for locomotion but so bad for, for giving birth? Well, there are a couple of theories and I'll just scoot over the one that I don't really agree with because that's just the, the way that uh, academic arguments work when I'm, in, I'm the one in front of the camera. Um, the first one is the, is the Savannah theory. And the Savannah theory effectively says that we found ourselves on the African plain, we adopted a bipedal gait because what that meant was that we could actually see predators and so on. Um, that's fine, that works, because we do stand upright, we can see predators. What it doesn't account for is the intermediate stages from the chimpanzee three, four-legged walk to the human bipedal walk. In the in intermediate stages were in fact the locomotion was very, very clumsy. So you're kind of shuffling along. So great, you've seen the predator, but you can't run away because you haven't yet developed the, uh, the, uh, the locomotor skills to do so. So I don't think that really works as a theory. Nonetheless, in fairness, I need to say in the context of this podcast, that is the theory that most people accept. The theory that I most favour is the aquatic ape hypothesis. This is a hypothesis that effectively says at some point in our evolutionary past, what happened was that we're in the forest, we're in the, we're, we're in the place where we evolved, and it got wet, and it got very wet, it got so wet that what was happening was that we were left swimming around in the water. Okay, so. If there was a flood, for example, then the gorillas would take the higher ground, the chimpanzees would take the trees, and because we were the smallest and the weakest of the lot, what would happen is that we'd find ourselves splashing around in the bottom. Cut to a million years later, and what you see is that our species becomes fully adapted uh, as a semi-aquatic animal. This is where the human story began, millions of years ago, in the heart of Africa. But how it began remains something of a mystery. There's a gap in the fossil record when we can only guess what was going on. The gap in our knowledge lasts from roughly four million to seven million years ago. We know that apes went into it and ape men came out of it, but that's all we do know. Oh, and the ape men, of course, when they came out, we know what happened to them. There aren't any missing links in the popular sense. We can trace our ancestry back for over three million years and we can see how those ape men turned into modern men. But back in that very early formative stage, that's when the picture becomes vague. Why did we shed our coat of fur, stand up on our hind legs and start to talk? To understand why this took place, we need to discover where it took place. Perhaps it all happened here on the open savanna. The traditional view, and it's only a guess, is that our ancient ancestors left the cover of the forest and moved out onto the open plains in pursuit of large prey animals. Once in open country, they had to face a hot, dry, exposed environment. How did they adapt to it? Other animals that live in hot, dry environments have evolved special survival mechanisms that reduce their water loss. Surprisingly, we have none of these. We have to drink more than any other land mammal, we sweat more than any other mammal, and we die quickly if we overheat. We have dilute urine and moist dung. These five qualities contrast strongly with the water economy of the typical savanna living animals. The truth is that we're simply not well adapted to savanna living. So what did we do when we left the protection of the undergrowth? The traditional view of how ape became ape man has recently been challenged. It's thought that there might have been a vital intermediate stage. Instead of coming out of the forest and straight onto the open grasslands, the idea is that our remote ancestors went instead to the water's edge. There they went more and more into the water, becoming what you might almost call an aquatic ape. Newborn babies, under careful supervision, can swim without any training. Placed in a prone position in warm water, they show no panic, keep their eyes wide open, and automatically hold their breath. Champion breath holders can hold their breath for up to three and a half minutes underwater. This and the swimming ability of the newborn are, to say the least, strange qualities for a savanna living animal. There are a number of other aquatic features of our species. 
we have an unusually strong diving reflex that slows down our heartbeat when we put our face under water. Like other aquatic mammals, but no other primates, we have a layer of blubber beneath our skin. We've lost the long, shaggy coat of other primates, making us more streamlined in the water. We have a unique nose shape that shields our nostrils when we dive below the surface. We have more flexible spines than other apes, enabling us to swim more rapidly. We have partial webbing between our fingers and toes, again, unlike any other primate. And most people are surprised to learn that anatomical records reveal that even today, 7% of the world's population of humans still have webbed toes, where a small piece of tissue connects the toes along their full length. We weep copious tears, like other marine animals, but unlike apes. We can swim with great athleticism. Apes cannot swim at all. And the directions of our hair tracts differ from those of other apes, following the flow of the water. Assembled in this way, the evidence for the aquatic origin of our species certainly looks impressive. If this human baptism took place, it probably occurred here on the estuaries of the East African coast. One of the effects of moving into the water for these aquatic apes would have been to find immediately a wonderfully nutritious source of food, a new kind of food, a change from the fruits of the forest to the fruit de mer. These small boys in Kenya's Rift Valley are behaving rather like otters, catching fish without the aid of any weapons. They're living today in the very region where the human species evolved. Could this have been the preferred way of life of our early ancestors several million years ago? A switch to an aquatic lifestyle would suddenly have made available a high-protein diet that would have reduced the amount of time they had to spend finding food. This would have given them more opportunities for other activities, activities that could have led them to develop important new skills. Their ancient ability to open tough nuts and fruits would have made them immediately adept at cracking open the hard shells of a great deal of easily collected seafood. Marine mollusks and crustaceans would have had no protection from the attacks of this new type of predator. They were a plentiful food supply just waiting to be exploited. Furthermore, a diet of fish and shellfish would have provided the aquatic apes with an enriched source of the fatty acids that are important for brain development. An aquatic ape could easily have become a more brainy ape. These are the amazing Muru Army divers of the Philippines. Each member of a large team of young male divers lowers a rock attached to a long line down to the seabed. Strips of white material scare the fish and as the lines are moved along with their rocks repeatedly banging on the reefs below, they drive all the fish before them into an enormous net. Once all the fish are in the net, the young divers descend without any breathing apparatus to a depth of 80 feet where they may stay for up to three minutes. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Desmond. The, the interesting part about Desmond Morris making that talk is because um, when I first became aware of the aquatic ape hypothesis, it was because of one of Desmond Morris's books called The Naked Ape, which was, which was quite a, a big seller in the 60s and the 70s. Um, it was actually a bit sexist, to be honest, and in the 60s and the 70s, people were quite sensitive to that sort of thing. So uh, a woman called Elaine Morgan actually wrote an alternative version of the, of the Naked Ape, which she called The Descent of Woman. And instead of taking the male perspective that Morris was taking, she took the female perspective and, and looked at all the problems that the females had to overcome. Um, and 
Most interestingly, Desmond Morris now speaking about the aquatic ape hypothesis because even he's been convinced by the veracity of this argument, which is why I show you this one rather than the savannah uh, hypothesis. They make the point, though, that a lot of our evolution in this sense was it related to the sea. It was related to being in seawater. And I think that there's a kind of couple of paradoxes in that. The first thing is that we can't survive only on seawater. We can't drink seawater. It's not something that we, can, uh, that we can get by on. The second thing is that we don't even really like the feel of seawater in our skin. And if we do go to the beach for a, for a holiday or something like this, what will happen is that we'll come out of the sea and we'll actually wash the salt off. We'll take a shower because we like fresh water, not salt water. It says to me that the aquatic phase of our development was probably in fresh water, not salt water. And what this slide shows you is the way another species emerged because of floods that happened in the Congo Plain. We know about chimpanzees and we know about gorillas. Uh, only recently do we know about a third species which are known as bonobos, panpaniscus. They're only discovered recently as 1929. Why they're a different species is because of the way that the floods happened in the Congo Basin. And what happened is that the floods water comes up, the flood water comes down. And as far as the bonobos was concerned, when the flood water went away, they found themselves on the southern bank of the river where no gorillas were and where no ch other chimpanzees were. And in the northern bank, that's where the chimpanzees and the gorillas carried on coexisting. That simple switch meant that their lifestyles could be very different. Chimpanzees are quite aggressive when they meet each other. They're, uh, ruled by, by dominant animals that are aggressive to everybody. Um, the reason for this is because they have to go and forage in different parts of the forest during the day and only coming back to meet uh, up together uh, towards, towards the end of the night. They have to forage away because the gorillas are, are eating all the easy available uh, uh, undergrowth. On the southern part of the Congo, the gorillas aren't there. So what it means is that the bonobos can just stroll around and feed themselves as easily as they want to. So that means that socially they can stay together in their groups. It means they're a lot less aggressive. It actually means that the males are no longer the ones in charge. It means that the females are the ones in charge. These are, these are a matriarchal species. So one flood isolates one species, a dramatic effect on behavior. So following that thought down, um, to look at the way this could have affected the human species. Imagine the forest is flooded, not for a week, not for a few days, but for a million years. We're the species that can't get onto the high ground. We're the species that can't go to the fruit trees because that's where the chimpanzees are. We're left in the water. And water is very important when we start to talk about bipedalism because in the savannah theory, what happens is that, yes, you can see the predator, but you can't run away very efficiently because you're not fully evolved to be bipedal yet. In the water, all that becomes much easier. The water is the supporting medium Animals go into the water almost on tippy toes anyway and because the water is supporting the muscles and all the other organs that need to change can change as far as that's concerned. So the thinking is that the aquatic environment was the aid and the stimulus that made us a bipedal species instead of a quadrupedal species. That's actually not uh, so random because every other aquatic species is also, um, is also in the same plane. So if you think about a dolphin, it's all in one plane. If you think about a whale, it's all in one plane. So we're just following the same pattern that the whales and dolphins follow. And this little slide here just shows the sequence as I can see that what happens is that um, the rather hairy looking uh, Bonobo in this case goes into the water, but it's meant to represent one of our ancestral species. Cut to a million years, and what happens is the hairless, um, adapted for the water human comes out, because obviously our hairlessness is an adaptation to being in water. You don't see hairy dolphins, you don't see hairy whales, you don't see hairy humans in all over their bodies. So that tells us that we're an aquatic species. Okay, so the thing about floods is that eventually they go away. Okay, so eventually the floods will go away and floods are always followed by a drought. So when talking a cycle here of flooding and droughting, initially a flood for a long time and then much more rapid cycling. And the historical record, the uh, uh, geological record of the Congo Basin tells us this is what happened. So what does that mean for our species then? Well, what it means is that we're adapted for the water and then suddenly the water starts to go away. So what we've got to do is to start to do things very, very differently. The drought also explains another paradox about our species that we need fish in our diet. 
So we actually need the omega oils that come from fish. Ask yourself, how does a primate species living in a forest come to start to eat fish? I mean, you don't develop a fishing rod before you, start, you develop a taste for the fish, so there's got to be some other reason for it. And the drought would be the reason that explains that, at least in my mind. What happens is that as the water recedes, the, you're left with ponds and pools, all those fish, this happens even now, go into those ponds and pools. So there we are, we're a species, we're opportunistic, we'll eat most things, we'll try most things. Oh look, there's a pool full of fish, let's just stick your hand in and eat them. And suddenly there's the most richest available food source that, that you could possibly imagine. The water dries out even more, we start to migrate, we start to go onto the savanna, so the savanna theory isn't wrong, it's just not the explanation for everything that's going on. And that's when we started our move towards the sea because it was still more moist and so on. So what this slide shows you is the food substances that we require. This is the stuff that we have to have, but our bodies no longer make for themselves. That they, they need it, but they, they can have the luxury of not making it for themselves because there's so much of it in the environment, at least the evolutionary environment, that we no longer have to make it. So what is it? Well, it's vitamin Bs, that's coming from, from meat and so on. It's iodine coming from fish. It's the fatty acids and so on also coming from fish. And clearly we need fruits as well. So the patterns of the demands of our body Body, tells us that what we had was a primate type fruit phase, a phase where all we did was eat a lot of fish and then now into the more modern era where we can eat meat and so on as well. And again that's not uniquely human because chimpanzees will also go hunting, they will also eat meat, in fact that's the only food that they will share with each other. We also had uh, a period of scavenging as well. The idea that humans were, were hunters isn't quite a clean cut one um, because before we started killing our own food, what we did was to scavenge the meat off others. And this slide shows you an electron micrograph and the electron micrograph shows very clearly that we were scavengers because that big scar of, al along the bone just there, that's actually made by the tooth mark of a predator. That second line that you can see going this way is a much finer line made by a stone tool. So what's happened is the predators killed the animal and then the ancestral humans come along and used a stone tool to peel off the, the leftover meat. So scavengers as well. Here are some examples of the stone tools and as you can see they go back millions of years and you can presume that there were going to be wooden tools before that and as we become forward in time those stone tools become more and more complicated, in fact very very sophisticated. This one I'm not sure if you can see but it actually shows you uh, on a mammoth's tusks the carving of a mammoth made by our ancestral species. And this final slide here just runs through the, the advancements and the technological advancements that we've made as a species. Stone tools two or three million years ago, butchery for the reasons I've shown you with the, uh, the marks on the bones. Fire, we can tell because it changes the magnetism of the rocks and so we know when man was making fire. Scalping, well again you can use your imagination to see where the evidence for that is. Wooden tools, Having said wooden tools, those are only the ones that survived because remember wood doesn't fossilise so we know there was wood there but wood would have preceded the stone tools without a doubt as well. And then finally burial, we bury our dead, we don't just discard them in the street, we bury them. How do we know that our ancestral species did the same thing? Well because you, know, you, you look not only at the fossil remains but you look at the substances that are around it, you look at the matrix around it. And what you find in the matrix immediately around the body is about five million times more pollen seeds and poll pollen grains um, in, the, in the matrix around the body than you see a meter either side of it. What does that tell you? It tells you there's a hole in the ground, there's a body in it, and they put flowers on the body there in exactly the same way as we do. So that brings to an end the third part of this podcast and what it's done is to try and put uh, the unique characteristics of humans in context and trying to give you some sort of um, reasonable explanation about how this could have happened. So the discussion point for the uh, end of the third part of the, of the podcast is how would we be different as a species if we hadn't gone through this aquatic phase? So just try and imagine what, what we would be like as a species if, if we hadn't have gone through the, uh, the, the water phase.